What we're seeing is that Ethereum is passing from the realm of a confidence vehicle into a cash flow vehicle. It's passing from the realm of what could be into what is and is live today. And these, you know, hundreds of apps are, are flourishing and being built today. In order to use the apps, you have to pay the transaction fee. That is Ethereum's business model. It's an open access, global public utility and app platform that anyone can use. You, you can make your own app. Your company can make your own app. Of course, most of us are just gonna use the apps that other people create, just like the app store. Ryan, welcome to the show. Hello. Good to meet you. Thanks for having me. <laughs> I have to say, man, first off, we have to comment. You've got the best background I've had <laughs> on the show so far in a long time. Could, Thanks, for man. People who, who, people who are watching on the vigil, could you paint a picture of what, or, or people who are listening only and not seeing this, what is this behind you right now? Well, it's sort of a magic castle in a magic world, and there's a, a moonbeam coming down that's a sort of a magical moonbeam, and it... I think speaks to the castles in the sky that we're trying to build here in uh, the crypto industry. <laughs> man, I love it. Uh, well, listen, man, you've been writing some awesome stuff on Twitter. That's how we got connected, uh, specifically on Ethereum and that world. And we're, we're going to go into a lot of detail around that today. Um, but before that, you've got a, a varied background. So why don't you just share, like, what was your background before you got into Ethereum and, and the crypto space before that? I come from the engineering world and I went to computer science school in Canada and uh, at the beginning of my career was very fortunate to do a stint at amazon.com where I kind of cut my teeth in terms of serious engineering and then after leaving Amazon uh, I've been mostly in the opposite end of the spectrum in the startup world working for small companies a uh, couple of my own uh, none of which you know had terrific success uh, and then I was very fortunate uh, a few years back to arrive at uh, a fintech uh, in New York, sort of not at all crypto based. And at that fintech, uh, I I had some coworkers who were very into crypto. And I've been in, I've been into crypto over the years. You know, first first invested in Bitcoin. You know, maybe maybe oh I don't know tw twenty fourteen. Uh, not not in a big way necessarily. And it was really in that little think tank uh, at, at this at this company where I my interest just took hold and root and you know I realized that hey I can be an investor and you know from then on I uh, I got in in a serious way and I've been in the space full time for several years and you know one of my favorite things about becoming involved in crypto is it's just so rewarding to start down that rabbit hole and get involved in Ethereum and see the applications that folks are building and the changes they're trying to bring to the world, you know, especially creating a level playing field. So uh, we'll get into that. And for me, uh, it's just, it's something that really synced up with my background because I, I was always multidisciplinary uh, in school. It was computer science uh, primarily, but then also economics, a bit of finance, a fair bit of math and cryptocurrency and Ethereum uh, being about money and people uh, and and distributed systems it's kind of an area of computer science it it really rewards cross-functional people uh, so that's something that's been just just a joy to get involved with and sort of a continuation you know from computer science into e-commerce at amazon towards the startup ecosystem and and now in crypto where uh, they just uh, it's an area that really allows you to spread your wings and find your own niche and you know contribute because you love it. So I'd certainly recommend it to anyone who's interested in, you know, taking a closer look. Yeah, for sure, man. Well, uh, people who've listened to the show for a while probably know that I've been interested in this space for a little bit of time. I definitely am not as deep in it as you are. Um, 
And I will say up front that nothing we talk about today is investment advice for legal reasons. <laughs> and uh, yeah, obviously this is just for informational purposes um, and do with it what you want. Um, and I also should disclose that I've owned Ethereum for some time as well, uh, or Ether and a bunch of other cryptocurrencies. Um, so we're, we're gonna touch on kind of the financial implications and stuff like that a little bit as well today, maybe in the second half. But what I love about your background is you've got this this technical background, so you truly understand like the, the ins and outs of how it works um, from a, an angle that I don't uh, have. So we're going to dig into a little bit of that, um, and also for the list for people listening, I, I guess to, to share, we're really trying to just break things down in as close to simple terms as we can because you know there's thousands of interviews out there on these topics. And it's really difficult to find stuff that is just explaining it in simple terms. And uh, and it's, there's a reason for that. It's because it does get quite complicated <laughs> quite quickly. Um, so you'll hear me stopping you at times and saying, hey, can we go into that a little bit more detail or define X, Y, Z? Um, so just, just to kick things off, um, why don't we start with blockchain uh, as a... Uh, as an umbrella term, uh, we're going to do a kind of like little definitions or examples first of blockchain, Bitcoin, and Ethereum. So I guess this all starts with with Bitcoin. Um, it it kind of starts with Bitcoin in, in recent terms. But if I was to say to you, how would you explain what the blockchain is to your grandma? Uh, what, how would you try to explain that to her? For sure. I'd say that about 12 years ago, an anonymous individual that no one knew, no one knows who they are named Satoshi Nakamoto could be one person could have been a team of people. Nobody knows. And they Satoshi Nakamoto discovered that it's actually possible to have a network of computer systems that functions normally, even if up to half of those computers are malicious or incompetent. So you're talking to your grandma, grandma, there's, there's this cloud nowadays, there's this computer network of the internet. And before 2009, before Bitcoin was invented, any computer you had you talked to essentially had to be an honest computer. There was that trust assumption. And that drived the centralized, the predominantly centralized nature of the internet in the 90s and the 2000s, that when you load your Facebook or you go to your Amazon.com, you're connecting to a computer owned by Facebook, by Amazon, or, you know, rented by them. And you're trusting that computer and you trust that in their brand, that computer is going to run normally. And this Satoshi uh, figure comes along and they invent Bitcoin, which is a financial application, but it's not necessarily the financial application of Bitcoin. That's the most novel part. The most novel part was that they figured out that it's possible to have a computer network we're up to half of the computers, or more specifically, half of the kind of computing horsepower can be malicious or incompetent. And so for the first time, we can have this network where as long as the majority of the participants are doing a good job, the whole network functions as a cohesive unit. And that's really the innovation uh, that was pioneered in Bitcoin. Got you. Yeah, that's awesome. I like that, um, that 51% kind of angle so uh, this is we we use the word decentralized a lot in this space and and if you look at the macro trends in technology uh for the next five ten years a lot of people who work in this space you know even if you just look at venture capitalists people that are investing uh money into uh, innovative startups and stuff like that a lot of them are looking at this macro trend of decentralization. And that doesn't mean just money and banks and the Fed and all that stuff. It also means potentially media um, and exchanges of value that aren't just money and, and several other things. Um, but I guess the question to you is like, why does decentralization specifically matter? Like, why is that something we should care about? Because, you know, I'm someone, both of us live in the States. Um, most of the time we feel pretty confident going across the street going to a chase bank and taking our money out right and most of us haven't really seen issues that have potentially been in places like argentina or venezuela where you turn up and they don't actually let you take your money out because there's there's problems there or most of us haven't experienced hyperinflation um which obviously lots of parts of the world have have experienced that so i'm just curious from your point of view why is something why is decentralization such an important thing for us to focus on in the next five, 10 years? Great question. 
Bilal, the first thing to understand about decentralization is that it's not necessarily a strict upgrade to a centralized system. It's not the case that because we've invented decentralization, we're going to decentralize all the things as a straight upgrade. You know, the way that obviously we like our flat screen TVs, right? Who wants to go back to the days when the TV was as wide as, you know, almost yeah. like a car in some cases. <laughs> yeah. It's crazy. So with a flat screen TV, kind of a straight upgrade. No, nobody's not going to opt into that. It just makes sense. You know, same with getting more gigabytes on your phone or, you know, faster internet. Decentralization is more like a the flip side to centralization. And if we look at something like uh, sort of this famous example in industry where, you know, why would you decentralize like Waffle House, you know? Like, what's wrong with Waffle House? You show up, you <laughs> swipe your credit card, you eat some yummy waffles, it's terrific. So there's not necessarily, we're, we're going to take steps to make sure that Waffle House is, uh, you know, censorship resistant or uh, gives you a very high level of personal property rights over your claim to, you know, a good breakfast or, or yeah. whatever, you know, it's, it's not a thing. So it, decentralization means that you don't have to trust it. It's a trustless system. And the interesting thing about that word trustless is that you think, oh, trustless, it doesn't have trust. So I can't trust it. Well, actually, that's not what the word means. When we say trustless, what it means is you don't have to trust it because the system always works. Mm, okay. The system doesn't require your trust because it's just sort of doing its thing. So when we think about the things that are going to be decentralized, uh, you know, kind of starting with a simple example of something like, like Bitcoin, you have this, this asset. And for the very first time in the history of the world, uh, like, what does it mean to own this Bitcoin asset? Well, uh, I'm able to have uh, my password that I've written down. It's actually called a, a private key or a, a, a secret recovery phrase. And so long as I don't show that to anyone, nobody in the world could ever hope to deprive me of my Bitcoin property rights. And it's that, that strong property right, stronger than anything in history. And my ability to always access my digital property that is that censorship resistance to access my digital property without anyone stopping me or censoring me from accessing it. That's the core of decentralization. And if we think back to human history in terms of all throughout history, you know, around the world today, but, but also, you know, centuries back, thousands of years back, the world was not a level playing field in all kinds of ways. You could be deprived of your property, you, you didn't get necessarily a seat at the table. You didn't get equal access to different kinds of services, uh, different kinds of banking services as, as an easy example. And so decentralization represents the opportunity to create a level playing field around open access, strong property rights, and the censorship resistance to make sure that you can actually exercise that open access in your property rights. And that's kind of what the technology does. And it can be applied, you know, almost anywhere, uh, you know, but it won't be applied everywhere because why do you want to decentralize Waffle House? There needs to be a good reason. <laughs> so yeah. when it comes to so, things like the money and the property rights uh, uh, yeah. uh, for, for th you know, financial use cases are an obvious direct hit there but it will be expanded to other kinds of property, other kinds of economic arrangements as well. And, and we can talk about that. Yeah, got, got you. So why don't we just try to explain like a Bitcoin transaction in simple terms, right? So we've, we've talked a bit about uh, what blockchain is. So there's, uh, from my understanding, there's, there's Bitcoin, the currency, which is what people hear about in the news most of the time. They're seeing the price go up to 60,000 and drop down to 30,000. And that's what they're mostly thinking about. But that's kind of that. That's one way Bitcoin is talked about. But there's also Bitcoin, which I think with a with a capital B, which is really the blockchain, right? Uh, or, or the Bitcoin blockchain. Um, so why, why don't we explain like what that? Oh, first of all, was that correct? Uh, am I messing messing? It is up correct, first? absolutely. Okay. And similar with Ethereum, since we're talking about it, there's Ethereum, the blockchain, and then Ether, which is the currency that 
is on Ethereum. There's also a bunch of other things built on the Ethereum um, blockchain, which we'll get to. So why don't we talk about Bitcoin transaction versus a, 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 a transaction that we might make through a bank or a wire transfer or an international payment or something like that. Um, and I'll try one. I start by saying what I understand as a typical bank transfer, right? Let's say I'm in the UK, you're in the US. I go to my bank and say, hey, I need to send 10 grand to my friend in the States. I log into online banking or I go to speak to them in a location. They then do some stuff on the back end, which we don't need to go into. And over three to five days, that somehow magically turns up in your account or a Western Union account or whatever it is that we're using in the traditional world. And then you go and look at your online banking and you see, oh, that's that's working. That's there. Thanks for sending me this below. So that, that's a very simplistic way of, of explaining a normal bank transfer. Um, and this assumes that you have access to a bank account, which we know many people don't have access to that. We also assume that it isn't intercepted by someone evil or something like that. But that, that's just one way of explaining it. Now, let's try to describe what is that in Bitcoin, in the Bitcoin uh, transaction instead? What does that look like? That's right. So to, to expand on that, to your point, Bilal, there's Bitcoin, the blockchain, which is a, a physical computer network, you know, just a part of the internet. And then there's Bitcoin, the asset with the stock ticker of BTC. And in Ethereum, it's the same thing. There's Ethereum, the blockchain, which is the physical computer network. Uh, and then there's uh, Ethereum, the asset with uh, Ether is the name of it. And it has the ticker ETH. And to describe the difference between a Bitcoin transaction and a traditional bank wire, you know, from, from England to, to New York, it's helpful to actually start with why Ethereum was invented. So in 2014, uh, there was this kid named Vitalik Buterin uh, who uh, was an avid Bitcoin person. And he, he was an editor of the Bitcoin magazine. And he, he was just so excited about the future of blockchain. And what he realized is that Bitcoin had the ability to create this decentralized property rights. It was this computer network where up to half of the participants could be malicious or incompetent, and it still worked. However, it wasn't built to be an app platform, you know, like the, like the app store on your yeah. iPhone. And it, he had this idea. He said, hey, I'm going to invent this new blockchain, Ethereum, and it's going to be like Bitcoin plus an app platform. And so that's how Ethereum was invented. So today, Ethereum has all kinds of apps that we can get into. And the reason it's helpful to have started with that foundation is because a great way to think about Bitcoin is it's kind of like if the Ethereum blockchain had only one single app, which is the ability to send your Bitcoin mm. to somebody else. Got it. So you, yeah. you, pardon me. No, no, no. That makes sense. Right. So you... You boot up the Bitcoin blockchain. Well, it's always running in the background. So you boot up your, you know, your portal to access the Bitcoin blockchain, which would be some software on your computer or on your phone. And then you say, okay, I'm going to use the single you know, app that comes with the Bitcoin blockchain, which is the ability to send my Bitcoin to other folks. And uh, Ethereum is essentially a, a world computer. It's like, yes, yeah, it's, it's an app platform. But it's also like if there was a single computer that we all shared access to. And when I go in there and I, I make an update, and we'll talk about that again, uh, you get to see that update right away because it's a single shared computer that we all have, have this global view into. And with Bitcoin, it works the same way, where when I boot up Bitcoin's single application to send my money, I'm going into my Bitcoin portal software and I'm saying... I want to send one Bitcoin to my friend, uh, and then I sign that transaction, which is the process of authorizing it by using my private key, my secret password that protects my property. And then my signed transaction is sort of like a little payload. It's like a little present, a little package. And it gets sent out into the, into the ether where the Bitcoin blockchain runs on the internet. And the Bitcoin blockchain will process that transaction and so I will then transfer my one Bitcoin from my Bitcoin wallet to my friend's Bitcoin wallet. 
And that's an effectively an irreversible transaction that settles instantly on the Bitcoin, you know, kind of global computer with this single application of all you can do on it is send your Bitcoin to your friends. Yeah, that's oh, I love that. Thanks for explaining that. I think another example I've heard which might be helpful is well, we haven't even used the word ledger yet, which is <laughs> probably uh, quite a key word here. Um, and I think most people know roughly what a ledger is, but it's essentially a a record of of transactions in this case, right? So in in Bitcoin's case, um, an example I heard which I thought was quite useful is we've all played Monopoly, right? And there's three of us around the table and then there's one person has to be the banker and we go and we roll the dice and we one of them, uh, we pick up a card and it says uh, Bilal needs to pay um, uh, my sister a hundred dollars and and uh, the banker is kind of there in the middle just seeing that that happens and sometimes you you run out of money you need to borrow some money and you go back to the banker or you pay the fine to the banker and what i i heard which i thought was quite a cool example is let's just say we now don't need that banker and it's just us three or four around the table and instead of us needing the banker at, when I say, hey, I'm sending $100 to you, we just r rip up a piece of paper and say, Bilal sent uh, you $100 and we put it to the side. And then we just keep playing the game and we keep stacking up that those pieces of paper. And now that is essentially a ledger and we can go back and say, oh, what happened or what timestamp uh, during the day? And, um, and we can make sure that the numbers make sense. And th that kind of a silly example kind of explains how the blockchain and bitcoin in this in this uh, example and, and ethereum because in its current state it still uses what's called proof of work um to to settle and confirm these transactions um so i, I just thought i shared that example because it was one that really resonated with me and made me understand it um so we, we talked a bit about um bitcoin there and then ethereum being this kind of computer this shared computer across the world and again you mentioned you know the cloud we all hear this phrase the cloud where w this magical cloud of computers sitting in the sky which are really in data centers right <laughs> um but um and and bitcoin is the same right like and and the blockchain is the same it's a bunch of computers spread around the world and different nodes on this network um but let, let's talk a little bit more about ethereum now so um, I, I love the way you explained it as an app store, like the Apple app store, because we've all, you know, played around with our, with our iPhones or Android and we get to the app store and we're like, oh, there's a calorie counter app and there's a uh, banking app from my bank. And, and that's what Ethereum is now doing, building or has been doing for several years, building these these apps on the platform. So um, could we give people a sense of a few examples of those sorts of applications that have already been built? on Ethereum? For sure. So the one of the most famous applications on Ethereum today is Uniswap. And that's over at uniswap.org. And Uniswap is a way to take one token and swap it for another token. And it works as a, a sort of money robot where, uh, like your example, where we don't actually need the monopoly banker, there's, there's simply no person who's sitting somewhere guaranteeing that your token swap goes okay. There's no employees required. It's just, it's a fully automated system on the blockchain. So that's a token swap. And what are these tokens? Well, one of them could be the ether token, the native token to the Ethereum blockchain, but tokens can be anything we want. A token could represent one share of Tesla, or for that matter, a token could represent one Bitcoin that's been uh, kind of wrapped and put inside the Ethereum blockchain. And today, uh, about 1% of all Bitcoins are wrapped inside the Ethereum blockchain to be used in Ethereum applications. Uh, so that, that token swapping that's a great is, example. is a... Yeah. yeah. Uh, is and a, can I just give a, a parallel to something other people, if they haven't heard of Uniswap, uh, yeah. Two examples, I'd say. Uh, I think of it as like a decentralized Coinbase, uh, and you know that's a, that's quite a broad statement because Coinbase does a lot of other things. But the way people think of, I download Coinbase, I link my bank account or my credit card, and substitute U.S. dollars, fiat currency, for Bitcoin, Ethereum, or some sort of currency. But that transaction of converting something is something that you can then do on Uniswap. Um, 
with you know all sorts of different currencies and tokens on there um but the difference is there isn't a bunch of employees just sitting at, a, at coinbase there's a smaller number of engineers working on this and they are um you know what is being done on that app is being verified through the code and it's being verified through that application not just through this company's website or, or app um and then the other example i'd use is um, when you land at an airport and you need to you know convert your currency there but you you go to the kiosk and someone's there and they speak to you and they actually do that for you but this is being done obviously online through through uniswap without you having to actually speak to anyone um so i, I don't know does that example make sense i love those good examples and All right. you know a couple <laughs> couple themes to pick up on yeah coinbase uh to keep your coinbase account secure they need a full team of security engineers uh, and much more, and they have regulatory relationships and they have their computers running in the cloud, in the data centers. With Uniswap, because the Ethereum world computer and app platform provides such a great foundation that anyone can build on if they pay the toll, the transaction fee, either to use the apps or create their own new app, the actual Uniswap app, the latest version of it was created in about one year by a team of less than 20 people and that's state-of-the-art financial crazy. technology. They didn't need a thousand engineers or five years. So it's just an incredibly new paradigm. Uh, and if that weren't enough, after the Uniswap app was created and uh, deployed to the Ethereum blockchain, after it became available for general use, they don't have any ongoing security requirements because the code that's been deployed to Ethereum, like once that app has been uploaded to the app store, unlike the traditional app store, they don't get to change it again. They've, they've set it up in such a way that people know that the Uniswap app is not gonna change out from under them. And that's this uh, very important concept called credible neutrality that's really driving a lot of the innovation in the space. And I'd, I'd, I'd love to expand on later in the conversation. Yeah, that's that's a great example. Yeah, let's definitely do that. So um, that's a great example, Uniswap. Are there any other examples that you're seeing that are kind of interesting? I, I think people have heard of NFTs nowadays where people are sharing uh, or basically proving ownership of, let's say, digital artwork. Um, that's one example. Are there any others that you think are worth mentioning? Yeah, to your point, NFTs are huge now. We, we think of them as being the very first truly mainstream thing to come out of crypto and you know, most NFTs uh, by dollar value are created and traded on Ethereum. And, uh, you know, what is an NFT? Well, it's, it's, it's a digital collectible and an NFT can represent crypto art, uh, which is, uh, you know, it's just like artwork that's digital and maybe fully on the blockchain or partially on the blockchain. But a cool thing is that an NFT can also represent uh, any kind of distinct piece of property, such as in the future, a deed to a house or uh, an intellectual property right for a royalty stream for a television show, or, and this is not uh, a future example, this is live today, uh, NFTs are also used for the Ethereum uh, domain name system. It's called ENS. Uh, so you can go and you can create uh, like an Ethereum domain, kind of like registering a regular domain for the internet, but it's on the Ethereum blockchain and your property right ownership over that Ethereum domain name is actually an NFT uh, that you can then, you know, you could take that NFT and you could sell it the same way that you'd sell a crypto art NFT uh, because there's this whole uh, interoperability layer, which is this idea that, hey, if you have an, an NFT is a little bit like a shipping container, you know, like shipping container was this miraculous invention that standardized shipping all over the world so that you could take a shipping container and you could load it on a series of ships in a series of ports. And they would guarantee that the machinery and equipment that they had that they invested in was going to work with the shipping container that's coming down the pipe. And that kind of standardization really drives wealth creation. And, and it works for NFTs as well, where, you know, if you have an idea for an NFT and, you know, you want to make an NFT for your company's, uh, you know, your, your company makes some kind of digital collectibles or, or you want to make an art NFT that your kid made this cool picture, or, or maybe you want to sell your car with an NFT. So you create an NFT that says, the owner of this NFT is entitled to my car 
And then you, you know, of course, you'd have to then honor that off of the blockchain, which which is a whole nother conversation. A physical piece, yeah. That's right. That you'd have to, to honor it. that physical piece. But you can take it and you can take that NFT and you can sell it through a range of marketplaces that exist today because it has that kind of shipping container functionality where it, it just works. Uh, so yeah, a- NFTs are really cool. And you know, today we hear about them mostly through uh, art, but there's going to be a lot of cool kinds of NFTs. a lot of, of other use cases. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, I love that example with the, I like the, the visual of the shipping container being uh, moved around. Um, and we, we don't have to go into a technical kind of def- definition of this, but all of this is um, essentially we're able to do these things on Ethereum because of something called smart contracts, right? And I think that the only reason I bring that up is because we all know what contracts are. Um, but what makes them smart is that they're executed through the code. Whereas in a in tr- in the traditional world, um, that, that example you said about royalties <clears throat> is a good one because at some point, yeah, there's plenty of royalty stuff that happens uh, automatically nowadays on you know, let's say on YouTube, you can uh, if you put a song, if we put a song in this in this podcast, it will automatically get flagged on YouTube, right? And that's because there's some sort of uh, you know listening system that's been developed. That's awesome, but there isn't necessarily um, what what we could potentially have in the future is uh, royalties being paid out through these smart contracts. So if I create a meme or I create something that goes viral and I can show that I have ownership of it, I can actually get a percentage of resale value or use case value in the future. Um, so I think that's probably something worth mentioning. Um, the other examples I've, that have really kind of landed for me are what are, what we're referring to as DeFi or decentralized finance. Uh, and we've kind of touched on some parts of that. You know, Uniswap, I think, is a part of that. Um, t- um, but if you think of all the parts of finance that we're used to, so what would you normally go to a bank for? To store your money, to earn interest on your money, to get a loan. Um, all of these things are now being replicated in this world of decentralized finance. And when you actually log on to one of these websites and play around with it and you click a button to link your Ethereum wallet um, and you can go in there and say, oh, I'm going to deposit a thousand dollars and someone else in the world is going to be able to borrow that from me. And through the contract, I'm going to get percent. I'm going to get a percentage yield, but it's all done through the code. That's where I can start to say, oh, this is being built right now. Right. It's not just an idea like it was five years ago. This is actually happening right now at scale in the millions and billions of dollars. So um, that, that was another one I wanted to mention. Um, are there any others to, to call out before we before we move on from uh, interesting use cases? Oh, yeah, there's there's a ton going on. And uh, I'll touch briefly on uh, just the example you gave where you talked about uh, the smart contract executing this and guaranteeing it. And a smart contract is just an app that can't lie because the code is run on the blockchain and the blockchain doesn't lie. It's kind of the whole point. And so if you think about, you know, you open up your Robinhood app and you go, you buy a share of GME or Tesla or something, it turns out that there is actually a a whole cottage industry of companies that sit between you and the actual stock exchange. It's like there's Robinhood and then Robinhood works with some folks and they work with some other folks. And you know, I don't have particular insight into that value chain, but I, I know it's a big one. And I know that uh, it's, it's one that requires uh, the trust and competence of everybody who's in that value chain, as well as they each get to take their own slice of the fee. So when you go over to Uniswap and you swap your tokens, you're, you're cutting out not just the middleman, but a whole set of middlemen. And those are people that you no longer have to pay as well as you no longer have to trust that they're going to do the job that you hired them to do, which of course, famously earlier this year, there were some owners of the GME stock on Robinhood that found that they were cut off from the ability to uh, buy more GME stock. I believe it was buy. They, they only cut yeah, off one. I was yeah. one of those people. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> well, so it, you, it was just for fun, but yeah, go, go, go ahead. Yeah, it's, 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 it's for fun, yet at the same time, when you take that Wall Street bets crowd and you show them that, hey, when you swap through Uniswap, that's your property. No one can take that away from you. No one can stop you from them selling it if you decide you want to sell it. 
this is very powerful world changing concepts. I mean, and that yeah. would be true if it were only in a single country, but the whole thing is inherently global. So mm. yeah, it's pretty cool. And that's a great point. Can, can I just add to one thing you said there, which I think is worth mentioning. The reason I'm able to earn a six, seven, sometimes even higher percent yield on lending my money out to someone else in this DeFi world is because that's how much the banks have been making for years, right? Like if you open up a bank and, and often higher, um, and, and I, I'm not trying to just put down the banks. I, don't, I think they offer a, a valid service, of course, and uh, I feel pretty safe with my money in an insured account. So there's Me definitely too. pros and cons. Um, but what I would say is when I log into my account and it tells me I'm earning a 0.01% interest rate on unlimited money that I could put in there, that seems a bit crazy because they are using that money, investing it on the back end, uh, gaining a yield, let's just say 7 8%. And then I get almost zero of that, um, and that's the business model. And that, again, it's not. I'm not saying it's evil. It just we're now seeing an alternative being built in front of our eyes. Where mm -hmm. if you do say, okay, we don't need that middleman anymore, I can go directly to you. You're going to pay uh, six percent on this loan, and most of the six percent goes to me. And maybe there's a tiny bit of fee in between or whatever. But that, just to visualize for people, that's where that money is coming from. It's not just magically coming out of thin air. It's always been there. Someone's been paying it, but there's been someone in the middle. Um, so that's right. Yeah, maybe we'll get into a, f a few more advanced examples of that in, in a minute. But was there anything else to add before we move on to uh, some other stuff in Ethereum? There's a really great app that is both a good example of something being built uh, around Ethereum not necessarily directly on Ethereum and an example of uh, cutting out the middleman to make you more money as the consumer who, whose money it is. And that's this app named, uh, brand new app named uh, Eco, E-C-O. And what Eco is, is it's like a Venmo or a cash app. Uh, and it's also like an Apple Pay. And they go ahead and give you 5% on the money you deposit today. Uh, it may not be that percentage today. I, I haven't checked in about a month, but uh, you know, they go ahead, they go ahead and give you 5%. And on their site, they have these explanations where they say, you know, this is not something, you know, you may be skeptical that we can offer you 5%. How can we do that? And it's just that this team has built something that's like a Venmo competitor, like an Apple Pay, but doesn't use the banks. It backbones onto Ethereum. Got it. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, I haven't I haven't heard of that one or, or played around with it. Um, so yeah, there's there's so many cool things being built in this space. Um, I wanted to just hone in on Ethereum specifically. So you wrote this awesome uh, piece that was going pretty viral when we first spoke called Ethereum cash flow. And um, I, I originally messaged you because I was like, Oh, this is really well written. It's simplified. It feels like I could share that with a banker and they would understand the value. <clears throat> um, but uh, I'm curious, like, why were you uh, writing this in the first place? Like, what was the intention with that piece? Thank you, first of all. Uh, so we, we wrote our report, ethereumcashflow.com in mid-April. And what our thesis is, kind of the message that we wanted to send out into the world, primarily to institutions and bankers, but really to ordinary investors at all uh, as well, uh, in, because the, these opportunities are available to everybody. It's a level playing field, right? So it's not investment advice, yet what, what our message was in this Ethereum cash flow report is that our thesis is that for about the 10, 11 years of the history of crypto token prices, so you, you go to your, your website that shows you the crypto token prices, and those prices go up and down like a roller coaster, and what we believe is that those prices have been primarily confidence driven uh, over, over the whole 10 years. You know, what do we think Bitcoin is worth? How popular is Bitcoin today? What's the Google search trend for Bitcoin? That kind of confidence based vehicle. And betting and on the future, not necessarily something that you're getting today. For sure. You know, it's all about what this could be. And what we're seeing is that Ethereum is passing from the realm of a confidence vehicle into a cash flow vehicle. It's passing from the realm of what could be into what is and is live today. And these you know, hundreds of apps are, are flourishing and being built today. 
And now, of course, people, well, maybe not part of it for me, it's of course, but in order to use the apps, you have to pay the transaction fee. That is Ethereum's business model. It's an open access, global public utility and app platform that anyone can use. You, you can make your own app. Your company can make your own app. Of course, most of us are just going to use the apps that other people create, just like the app store. And when you use those apps, you need to pay a fee uh, in order to access it. Now, those fees have historically been uh, a little high for individual users, that if you want to do a token swap, it might cost you like 20 bucks or 50 bucks transaction fee. And you're thinking, oh my goodness, I'm not going to pay $50 to do a token swap. What? Why is it so expensive? Well, that's a great question. And the great teams behind the space have been working for years to bring those fees down and grow the scalability of the Ethereum app platform so that it can serve billions of people over the next few years. And that work is really coming to fruition now as we speak, where uh, one of the most important and main uh, so-called scaling solutions uh, launched just in late May, just some 10 days ago. Uh, so it's really a very uh, critical time for industry where a lot of these long-term bets that were made are beginning to pay off. And as a result, fees, transaction fees for individual users are going to plummet. And it's going to be inexpensive for all of us to use the Ethereum blockchain and participate in this amazing theme park of the app economy. Yeah. And then, uh, but because we're all going to come in, we're all going to use Ethereum because of these, these great apps and the great developers who are building those apps and the, the, the money that powers those apps uh, because people trust Ethereum to put their money there. We're all going to pay tiny fees, but there's going to be millions of us. And in aggregate, it's going to end up being a lot of fees for Ethereum, a lot of revenue. And as a result, and what our thesis was on this Ethereum cash flow paper, uh, pardon me, report, uh, is that the total amount of fees that Ethereum is going to collect is going to be tons and tons of money. So we, we had projected Ethereum's revenue for this year at $8 billion, which is a lot of money for any kind of organization to make in its sixth year of life. Uh, so it's yeah, terrific crazy. growth. Yeah. And I think but beyond just, I think the money is definitely a huge indicator. But also for me personally, why I've been so bullish is just just the the, the increase as well in, in usage, right? And it's being used, like we said, in these peer-to-peer -peer lending protocols for um, earning yield for NFTs, like real use cases that people are using. Um, and, and the hope is 10 years from now, we've also got the contracts and we've replaced a percentage of lawyers who are doing more templ templatized work. Again, not against all lawyers at all. They do great work. But if we could take a, a segment of the work that's done by humans, that is a lot of the time on the lower level is just a template contract. And you know, you're know you pushing that out and you're signing a few things. If that was done through code and automatically through something like Ethereum, that would of course replace a huge part of productivity that can be used elsewhere. Um, and it, it follows the trend that we've seen over the last 20 years. So I think that's that's one thing that I've been really excited by. Um, to go into a few more things that you called out in the report, um, you, I, I like that you, you positioned it as this is a complement to Bitcoin. This isn't necessarily saying down with Bitcoin, Bitcoin's bad, like we often see on the internet <laughs> right now, especially it was we're a week after Miami Bitcoin week or whatever, whatever it was. And all I could see was people trying to say which one's going to be the dominant asset. And it is, it's a lot, right? <laughs> like instead of saying, okay, Bitcoin has its use case. It's, it's the OG. It's, it's people are investing in it. There's institutional money coming in. It's pretty bulletproof in terms of security. Um, but there's also this thing called Ethereum that can be complementary to it. So do you still think that's the case? Because I know you wrote this a few months ago. Um, or, or have you changed your, your mind on anything in that regard? I do think that's the case. Bitcoin is a store of value that has digital scarcity and strong security. And Ethereum takes those two concepts and, and it, Ethereum has those as well. It's, it has digital scarcity and strong security. And then it also adds an app platform that has great global utility 
uh, and cash flow, which is the fees that are paid to use the app platform. So Ethereum is sort of uh, uh, very much a bit of a next generation Bitcoin where all the things you can do on Bitcoin, you can also do inside Ethereum and then much more inside Ethereum. So Bitcoin's not going away. You know, it's, it's the OG. It has a great global brand. Yet in our view, Ethereum is sort of where things are headed yeah. uh, for, for those reasons. Uh, and then, you know, potentially a couple others as well, as, especially later this year, Ethereum is... Uh, switching to a new kind of technology to power the core of Ethereum. And uh, a key thing about that technology is that actually it increases security dramatically. Uh, and that's important be, uh, because 10 years from and now- Sorry, just to, just to go for a second. And just so yeah. we can name that, you're talking about ETH 2.0, right? That's right. And uh, whether that's the end of 2021, it might be early 2022 from what Vitalik said recently. Right. Um, but it's, it's something that has been, what, been worked on for some time. And, uh, and we can go into what that actually means in a second. But yeah, I didn't mean to cut you off, but just wanted to name it so people knew what it was. Perfect. That's right. So uh, ETH2, ETH if we're very lucky, may launch by end of year, uh, is expected to launch uh, before the end of Q1. and ETH, ETH 2.0 brings much greater security that is going to be necessary for Ethereum to serve as a foundation for the world's governments and mega corporations to put all their economic agreements and supply chain. And, you know, uh, but, but a month and a half ago, uh, two months ago, the European Investment Bank, which is uh, a branch of the European Central Bank, uh, they actually created a hundred million euros of bonds, sovereign European bonds on the Ethereum public blockchain with their partner, Goldman Sachs. And like, this is a pretty big deal. And the reason yeah. they've done that is because they trust Ethereum security and, you know, they maybe see some usefulness in it as well. And uh, so this upgrade to ETH 2.0 is going to increase the security that's really required to drive the global adoption onto Ethereum. But then the other benefit of this upgrade to ETH 2.0 is that Ethereum will no longer get, uh, it will no longer consume huge amounts of energy to make itself work. So we've all heard that, you know, Bitcoin is not environmentally friendly and it's not, it's, it's really not. Uh, it's true that Bitcoin has important applications in renewable energy. Uh, and, you know, myself, you know, I'm someone who's very excited about that. And I think that's very credible. Yet, nobody can stop, if, if you're powering your blockchain from energy consumption, you can't necessarily stop someone who owns a coal factory from gluing a bunch of Bitcoin miners to it or Ethereum miners. And that's something that's important to us in the Ethereum community. You know, we, we take environmental friendliness very seriously. And as a result of this upgrade to ETH 2.0, we're going to become environmentally friendly uh, to the extreme, you know, we're going to, you know, we're going to have less of a footprint than, you know, Netflix, for example. Yeah, no, that's a great point. Let, let's dig into that a little bit more. So to explain what that means, um, currently, we kind of described it before with the Monopoly game, but uh, we'll go into a little bit more technical detail. So you mentioned miners there, right? So Bitcoin, and let's say Ethereum for now as well with what is called proof of work. Um, the way this works is I send money to another person to one wallet to another and in between because we don't have a bank verifying it in this case we have the blockchain we have the Bitcoin protocol is verifying it and what happens is there's these people in the middle essentially or a computers in the middle which are called miners and through some complex you know um, algorithm stuff computing power stuff that i don't we don't need to go into right now and essentially use of energy right they're using electricity to run the computers they they confirm this transaction and make sure everything is where it is and it goes from one place to the other that at the moment is really energy intensive is kind of the argument from people who are bearish on this on on that way of doing things proof of work you know that that miner in the middle was proving through work which was solving this complex algorithm and what ethereum is moving to with eth 2.0 is proof of stake right 
so you know staking so it means instead of having to have a, a, a miner in the middle we're going to take Bilal's ethereum or your ethereum and we're going to put it on the blockchain and we're going to say use our and this is the part i'm not 100 percent sure if i'm describing correctly so correct me if i'm wrong but we're going to put my 32 ETH, which is the minimum if you're doing it through ethereum officially um and and you're going to use my ethereum to validate and that's going to reduce the um amount of energy needed by from what vitalik said i think 99 percent is the number i last heard so that last part i'm not 100 percent sure if i described it correctly um was there anything i missed there on on the proof of stake oh that was great uh 100 and proof of work uh creates security by burning energy whereas the eth 2.0 proof of stake upgrade creates security by taking the native token ether and locking it up in the system and like through the magic of the system that creates uh energy efficiency as well as increased security so they've been working on it a long time about five and a half years and it's it's really just getting getting over the line uh this year and and, and into q1 amazing yeah so to, to summarize uh your paper you talked about it being a complement to bitcoin uh, in terms of, a, especially as an a investor, if you're someone who's a banker and you're, or you're managing your own money and you're saying, how do I get exposure to this growing asset class or this growing world is something complementary. There's also scarcity and security. Uh, we talked about security there already. Why don't we talk a little bit about scarcity? Because from, from, from Bitcoin side, uh, the famous thing there is that there's only ever going to be 21 million Bitcoin, right? And that means that there's a limited supply, um, similar to how people thought about the gold standard in the past. Um, it was actually about limited supply versus what we have today, which is the Fed presses a button and prints as much money as they like. So what is the equivalent of the 21 million number um, or the, the method that Ethereum uses to, to have uh, scarcity uh, in the way it works? Great question. Ethereum does not operate in a hard supply cap model. And of course, you hear that and you think, oh my goodness, there's going to be any number of these Ether tokens. That means mine are going to get diluted. Uh, they're not going to be worth as much. No, that's not the case. Ethereum operates in a what's called a, a, a minimum viable issuance model, which is a bit of a mouthful. But all it means is that we're going to create as few of these tokens as is necessary to drive the long-term health of the system. And now kind of two, two detail items there. Uh, the first is that Ethereum is actually going to be deflationary uh, starting after the ETH 2.0 upgrade. And that's for technical reasons. So although there's not a hard cap, we're actually going to be destroying more of these Ether tokens than we're creating uh, potentially forever. Uh, or my group thinks, you know, more likely for maybe a three to five year period as the whole system stabilizes. And when it does, and sorry, that's called uh, is E one. What's it called again? It yeah, that's right. With... It's EIP fifteen fifty nine. Okay, yeah, uh, whoever named that needs, a, needs to rename it. But anyway, <laughs> the only reason I mentioned that is because people who are reading about this might have heard of that phrase, and I wanted to make sure we tied it together. So this is where essentially um, through transactions, there will be a little bit of ether that burns each time. Is that right? That's right. And and that's what you're describing as deflationary because the, the amount of ether out there in the ecosystem is going to be going down by burning this each time. And, and uh, could you explain like why that is? What, why do they, what, they, they weren't doing that previously and why are they introducing that? Right. So uh, EIP-1559 or 1559 is an upgrade that is not supposed to have anything to do with monetary policy or token burning. That's not actually why it was created. It was created to introduce the concept of a, a system gas price, kind of a prevailing market system gas price. Or, or pardon me, uh, transaction fee. So when we say gas price, we just mean how much it costs to use the blockchain, the Ethereum blockchain at this exact moment. And before 1559, uh, when we wanted to use the blockchain, you actually had to pick the fee that you wanted to pay. So you'd say, oh, I'm gonna pay a fee of 30. And the challenge there is 
when you went and, and anyone who's used the blockchain like more than five times has had this issue where you set your fee to 30 and you send that transaction off into the wild to, to get applied to the blockchain. And, and then you're waiting and you wait longer. And what's actually happened is since you sent off that locked price of 30, the system kind of the prevailing market price has actually increased to 35, 42, whatever. And so you've now sent off a transaction that has a, a, a transaction fee baked into it that's not competitive. And you might have to wait like, you know, three hours uh, and, and you don't know how long you'll have to wait. And so 1559 is this lovely idea uh, to make life better for users like us, as well as app developers. And what it does is it says, we're going to introduce the idea of a system level transaction fee. And that system level transaction fee is going to go up or down depending on congestion and market conditions. And when I send off my transaction on, onto the blockchain to be applied, instead of locking in, you know, baking in this price of 30, instead what I bake in is I say, hey, I'm willing to pay whatever the system gas price is up to a maximum of 30. And then, so it kind of changes this idea of baking in a specific gas price of 30, and then instead upgrading it to this idea where we say, hey, I'll pay whatever it is. I don't want to wait. So I'm going to pay whatever I have to pay to get in now, but I want to protect myself. So I'm just going to pay up to a maximum of 30. So if it's 27, great. I'll pay 27, goes through right away. If it's 32, well, then I'm still going to have to wait, but that's because I've chosen to protect myself from this high fee. So 1559 introduced this idea of the system transaction fee. Uh, and as it happens, in order to make that work from a, uh, an economic perspective, it's actually necessary to destroy the transaction fee that was used to pay that system gas price for technical reasons. Got it. So just to clarify, is it in that example where you said, I've chose 30, I said I'm, I'm able to pay, I'm willing to pay up to 30, it actually goes through at 27. Is the part that's burnt the three in between or is it, did I, did I just make that last part up? Great question. You, uh, there is a part that's burnt, it's not that part. So if, okay. you, if you agree to pay up to 30 and it goes through at 27, that $3 difference, that's money in the bank for oh, you. Oh, it stays in my wallet. Stays Got in it. your wallet. And then Got of it. that 27, uh, actually all of it is burned. Now, okay. uh, an important detail here that I, I, I skipped in the original explanation is that uh, there's actually two parts to the transaction fee in EIP 1559. The first is a system gas price. That's the 27. It gets burned, all of it. That's where the deflation comes from. And the second part is a little tip where you can say, oh, I'm going to give a tip of four, you know, four. So I'm going to pay the system gas price of 27 up to 30. But also, whatever the system gas price happens to be, I'm also going to throw in a tip of four. And, you know, why would you want to include a tip? It's just to give you that extra control over making sure you get in when you want. And that's very useful to power users and experts. Got it. And out of that 27 plus four, what part of that now goes to Bilal or Ryan who's staking on the Ethereum blockchain? Because that's the part I, I know that if I was to stake, I would be earning something. But could you connect the dots for me? Like where out of that transaction, what lands in my wallet? That's right. So when you take your 32 Ether, if you're staking yourself, or you can stake much smaller amounts on, on your Coinbase or your Kraken exchange, where uh, you know you can stake half an ether, or, uh, one you know two yeah, ether. Most people aren't going to be able to do thirty-two ETH. That's a what is it? That's 60, 70, 80 grand by this point. Right. Yeah. And so you get involved in the staking process. You get rewarded for that by the system. So your rewards come in three flavors. You get three different kinds of rewards for being uh, a validator. The first kind is that you get that four tip. You get 100% of it if you were the one who made that actual block. Because uh, aside here, the, the blockchain is actually a chain of blocks. And it's like right now, every 15 seconds, uh, there is a block. And after ETH uh, 2.0, uh, the new block time is, I think, 12 and a half seconds. 
Uh, so every 12 and a half seconds, there's a new block in ETH 2.0. So it's literally a chain of blocks that kind of builds on itself like a Jenga tower or a Lego tower that just keeps getting taller and taller. And each of those individual blocks is actually created by one single validator. So if you have your 32 ether, that's one validator, every so often you're gonna get the opportunity to make a block. And you're like, oh great, it's my turn to make a block. I've been randomly chosen. I've, I've won the lottery of who gets to make the block. And when you put that block together, you're gonna go ahead and you're gonna get that four tip that we, we paid in our example. So you, you get 100% of the tip as the validator that makes so that's the block. The first, that's the first of that's three. That's the first. Go the ahead, second the one, two? The second one is that as an advanced topic, there's actually two ways to get your transactions onto the Ethereum blockchain. The first way is the regular way that we all know and love that we've just been discussing where you, you pay the fee and you wait and then you get on the blockchain. The second way is there's actually a fast lane that's being developed for, for technical reasons. And uh, that fast lane has a, a totally different fee structure that's based on a sealed bid process where you sort of, uh, it, 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 it's very complicated, but, uh, you know, and humans don't do this. It's only computers talking to other computers because it's a very fast lane. It's like every 12 seconds, the whole fast lane resets, you know? What's uh, the name of this? Is this, uh, yeah, what's this one called? Uh, the, the kind of the keywords the to Google lane. would be uh, MEV. It stands yeah. for maximally extractable value, uh, or uh, it also stands for minor extractable value. Okay. And then uh, the project to Google that'd be kind of um, more of a high level explanation is uh, Flashbots, all one word. Flashbots, so it's like, got it. It's like Flash Boys, the famous uh, novel, but yeah. with but bots like robots. Got it. And these fast, um, again, because a lot of people who have heard this, including myself, I've heard the word Flashbots. I've heard of side chains. Uh, I've heard of things which is like not the same thing, which yeah. is not the same thing, right? right? But but flashbots have been really helping recently. When we're recording this in June, the fees have been a lot um, smaller. I heard because flashbots are one of the contributing factors, right? Um, That's right. So th this is a fast lane. So if we're thinking of a highway, we've got everyone in three, four lanes. And if you want to be able to get in the fast lane, I'm assuming you pay slightly more or whatever to potentially get to a it. great deal more. Yeah, great deal more. Potentially, that, yeah. Okay, cool. And then I also would use that same analogy for the toll fee, right? Like you get to, you're going from New York to New Jersey on the bridge and you need to pay a small toll. That is almost kind of like the fee <laughs> a lot of the time um, in, in this space. So, so, so that's interesting. Did we cover all three then? So the first one- That was one, number two. So that the, was number two. Okay. Right, so to, to recap, uh, you pay a system fee at 27, you include a tip of four, uh, the first kind of validator earnings is the validator that makes the block gets the whole four. The validator that makes the block also gets uh, uh, her revenue from the fast lane, which is a, a separate side process. Uh, and then the third category is that uh, the whole collection of validators that's kind of helping out in that neck of the woods of the blockchain, they get fees to help out. So as the validator who makes the block, you get the biggest fee. That's kind of like your big, your big opportunity to get a big fee. Uh, but then all the validators that help out with that block also get a small fee as well. And they get that much more often because it's not just when they win the, the lottery to make the block. And uh, this third type of earnings is called, that's the inflation. That's the new issuance where the system is actually creating that new ether token to compensate the validators for their participation. And they get that new ether revenue, uh, that inflation revenue, even if there's no transactions at all. Got it. Okay. So those are the three types of ways. And that's for an official validator, right? Like the minimum of 32 ETH. You, you already uh, mentioned that there's other ways to do this through Coinbase Kraken. There's also something called Lido, I think, which is like liquid staking, which is a whole, that will take a whole hour to go into the details of that. It's like DeFi but staking. Yeah, it's, it's cool. DeFi staking. Yeah, and, and actually we could do it in 10 seconds. Oh, go, it, go for it. Let's do Coinbase, it. In Coinbase, you, you deposit your Ether and it's like, okay, I deposited it. But for Lido, you hop over to Uniswap, you take your regular Ethereum tokens, and you swap them for Lido's, uh, it's called staked ether. And the stock ticker is lowercase st and then uppercase eth, like, like the regular ether token. 
So you take your staked ether and you get it in your Uniswap swap. And then all you actually have to do is hold that staked ether and you get the benefits of staking, which is really, really cool to be able to get the benefits of staking via a token swap instead of actually having to do the validator staking process yourself or deposit in Coinbase. Amazing. Yeah, so that's, that's uh, and what I like about that is because when I first heard about, you know, being able to earn a yield on this, I thought, well, if that's the correct phrase, um, I was like, oh, that's great. If you've got 32 ETH, that's great. But for most people, that's not going to be the case. And for something where the ethos is all about access and anyone should be able to benefit from this, this definitely democratizes that part of it at least. Um, and so, so I think that's interesting. So what... Let's be very specific now with a few examples of real numbers that you're seeing in the current um, ecosystem and potentially what that might look in the future in terms of, of a percentage yield. And um, again, like I, I, from what I've seen, and I think I read this from something you wrote right now, if you were staking um, the 32 ETH, you can probably expect to earn about 7% uh, yield, like a yearly yield is how I'm uh, understanding it so that means if i had a hundred dollars i'd be earning seven dollars on top of that and that is kind of in line with the average of the stock market and you know things if you're in investing world that's a pretty good return am i oversimplifying it though because you know what what is a, a better comparable from what you're seeing i think that's right so the actual interest rate that you get for being a validator that yield uh, is going to depend on market conditions. And today, at this exact moment, it's 6.8%, and it's been going down steadily because participation has been ramping up steadily. And uh, the, the short story is that when the upgrade to Ethereum 2.0 happens, the day of that upgrade, all of the transaction fee revenue, you know, including the, the fast lane revenue, that Today, as we're sitting here speaking, that all goes to the miners. Every block, it goes to the miners. Well, the day of that Ethereum 2.0 upgrade, it all redirects and it goes to the validators. And so the best model we have suggests that uh, the day before the merge, uh, so this model shows the merge as uh, happening later this year. So actually, I can actually, uh, uh, pardon me. If you just give me just one moment, no, I'm going to get the time. actual real number here. So this model that we have suggests that uh, if the merge happens, say, Jan 1, uh, and the merge is the, uh, uh, ETH2 merge. The, the ETH2 merge, yeah, it's the pet name for the ETH2 upgrade. Yeah. And it, if that happens on January 1st, the day before the merge, the yield that we expect uh, for validators the day before the merge is going to be about 5% based on that ramping up participation. So between now and GN1, it's gonna go from the 6.8% today as we're talking down to the 5% the day before the merge on our hypothetical date of January 1. Now, uh, based on this model, uh, what we see is that the day of the merge, the validator yield jumps to uh, about 22%. And that's, and that's based because on... that big slice of the pie that was going to um, proof of work miners is now the, the pie has increased and the number of validators hasn't obviously increased overnight uh, that much unless that was something they worked on. Is that am I understanding that correctly? Exactly. It's that there's this fire hose of transaction fees that today goes to miners and the day of the merge, it just gets redirected over to your validators. And in, in our model, not our model, but the best model we have available, uh, you know, we're seeing that the interest rate could really rise from 5% up to that 22% uh, that mark. And then it sort of uh, steadily goes down after there. And uh, about a year later, it's, it's down to 6%. And got it. Yeah. So it would kind of, there'll be like a, a, an equilibrium of, or downward pressure as then the assumption is that more people would validate that, you know, someone sees 22% and they're, when I say someone, I mean, people, organizations, whoever, that's a really attractive rate and more and more people would pile into it. And then that would increase uh, the number of validators and therefore decrease the yield. Right. But exactly. what happens if, does this also take into account 
the increase in usage of ethereum and if let's say a bunch more institutional money comes into it or pe more people are building on top of it uh, is that also trying to take into account that factor as well we try but to your point there's a ton of variables so what we've done is we've baked our assumptions in about the amount of fees the amount of fast lane revenue the amount of interest for new stakers and and we've kind of baked that in and so the Got actual it. numbers could could really diverge quite a bit from this uh that being said uh something that's not well understood that's kind of like uh like i would say like a real hot tip uh is that there's actually a, a rate limiter on how many new validators can join the system and it turns out that the rate limiter is quite significant it's called the validator activation queue and it's a it's a queue like we're, we're queuing to get lunch at the barbecue yeah. place there's 90 at people the waffle ahead of house. Us. <laughs> at the waffle house that's yeah. right we're back there we're back there and in this queue it turns out that for technical reasons it's only allowed to run at a certain speed and so this exact day uh today the queue is about uh six days <laughs> today I I the queue before. is uh eight days Oh, wow. It's gone up. Yeah. It's so, so that is essentially, so that just to clarify, that's, I say, Hey, I've got 32. If I want to join, join the line, the queue to get in on the action. But right now I would, I would press a button or whatever, and I'd still be waiting eight days for that to happen. That's right. You'd wait eight days. And during that eight days, you're not getting any rewards. Your yield is 0% during those eight days. And then Got once it. you get to the front of the queue and your validator activates, you start getting your fair share of the rewards, which, which is going to be, you know, a fair, a fairly good yield, we think. Uh, and our, one of our kind of recent insights is that we think this queue is going to grow to like six, nine, 12 months long. So we think there's going to be a bit of a staking gold rush. Oh, wow. And like right now is the time to get in because, uh, the general kind of the common knowledge that this queue has the potential to get so long and and protect early stakers right because if if you get in the theme park uh, you know i uh i was very lucky a couple of years back uh my wife and i went to harry potter world in universal i uh, totally recommend it yeah uh, you know we're big harry potter fans and yeah of course i heard it's amazing it's amazing and we stayed on the resort in kind of like you know one of the the marriott type places you know, not, not next door, but you know, we had to walk a distance. And yeah. as part of that, we were allowed in the park like one hour earlier. And you think, oh, what, what difference does that make? Well, it makes one heck of a difference when you see like the line of a thousand people waiting to get in the park, you know, they're oh, in line yeah. for 45 minutes. It's like global entry at the airport, you, wherever you can, it's always a good thing most of the time. Well, just a quick question on, uh, to wrap that last bit up. Um, so what do you think happens let's fast forward right let's assume the merge goes well everything's working fine there's no big hiccups more people pile in um if everyone is going to be able to essentially stake in a way even if they're not one of the 32 if official validators they're using lido or coinbase or whatever do you just think in the long term though this yield of six percent just goes all the way down because everyone has the ability to do it. So the more people that do it, the more, because there's, there's really re no reason not to almost by that stage, if there's less risk anyway. Um, I, I'm curious, how do you see that playing out in the future? That's right. So we, we expect this whole uh, queuing to become a validator to uh, play out over a period of about two years, uh, slightly less than two years, or uh, maybe a year and a half. And after that year and a half, the yield is going to stabilize and it's probably going to be pretty low. It's probably going to be like, uh, you know, I, I don't want to speculate too much, but it, it, it could be 2%. It could be 4%. It all depends on what the opportunities, uh, what opportunities are available outside of validating. That's kind of the opportunity Got cost it. of validating. Uh, but an important thing is that in our view, staking is going to be so attractive that almost all of the Ethereum tokens, that Ether, is going to end up staked. So staking is going to be, we think, the, the normal state of affairs, and there will be a small amount of Ether that's not staked that people will buy and sell and consume and burn to pay for those transaction fees. Got Yeah, that makes sense. Um, okay, cool, man. So I'll try to summarize what I heard from that whole section. 
It's a complement to Bitcoin. There's scarcity baked in. It's deflationary. Uh, security is great based on the new model. I think the existing model is already very secure, but the n the next model is is as secure, if not more. Um, the environmentally friendly part is really worth mentioning. Moving from proof of work to proof of stake, um, Vitalik, the founder of uh, Ethereum, said that it would be probably a 99% reduction in energy. I, I think that's if I got that correct, if I remember correctly. And then at the moment, there's a there's a high likelihood of being able to cash flow from this asset that you're holding. Probably six seven percent could go up to twenty percent. Who knows? And long term, it will probably go back down. And uh, the more people use it, um, so that was a summary of that section. And I think just to be fair, and obviously both of us are uh, Ethereum bulls, and we we like the the asset, and we like what's going on in that ecosystem. I always like to try to paint a fair picture and make sure that we cover the other side too. So like, what would someone who's bearish on this asset, someone who's betting against Ethereum, what would they be saying um, it, from your research? They would say that the proof of stake upgrade, this ETH 2.0 upgrade is not proven. And they're right. You know, it's, it's uh, the researchers think the world of it and they worked a long time on it. And uh, the actual Ethereum 2.0 proof of stake blockchain, it's actually, a, it's kind of a new blockchain. Uh, and then it will merge with the old blockchain and the whole thing will just become Ethereum. So there won't be a V2 anymore. It'll just be the one thing. But this proof of stake blockchain has already been running since last December. So it's, it's building credibility. It's building that track record. But at the end of the day, this is a much newer technology than proof of work. And it's much more complicated. So uh, you know, we're really banking on it working and, and the bear case is that it doesn't work. That's yeah, that's fair. And and just so I understand, it's kind of like an app for, for people listening. You, you, you know, in a much simpler way, there's like a beta test almost going on right now, right? Like there's a small amount of transactions being run on it, I think. And then they're trying to figure out like, does this work properly? And as they keep scaling up, when they do a full merge, that's when it will be full fledged. Does this work or not, I guess, is the moment of truth. That's right. Except um, with the caveat that there's not a small amount of transactions running on it. Oh, okay. No, nobody's able to use it right now. It's just sort of uh, coming. Oh, it's, it's kind of sitting there. It's just kind of sitting there doing its thing, you know, uh, but not actually serving any any actual traffic. You know? Got it. Got it. And sorry, just to clarify, I've also heard the phrase beacon chain. Is this the same as the beacon chain or is that something else? It's the same thing. That's right. The beacon okay. chain is the new blockchain for the proof of stake upgrade. Got it. Got it. All right. Perfect, man. So that was, I mean, this is incredibly in depth. I think this is super helpful for people. And if you're still following along, we've got some more stuff for you coming. Um, the other bear case that I will say, hearing other people, um, there's two things really is, are the alternatives going to be better, right? The other smart contract style blockchains, um, things like Solana, uh, I think Cardano, Binance Smart Chain, there's a few that are like, um, we can maybe talk about those in a second. Um, but before we get onto that, it's just the Bitcoin bulls, right? Like if you speak to someone who's a Bitcoin maximalist, like I'm thinking of someone like Pomp, right? So Pomp, I had him on the show, great guy. I really like his stuff. Uh, but I can see from recent times, like he's been completely like, Every, his bet is on Bitcoin and what are called layer two solutions being built on Bitcoin, right? So again, not to get in, all the, in the weeds of this, but the, the use case of smart contracts and faster transactions and all the different things that we are seeing already on Ethereum are being built potentially, uh, I, I don't know the details, but are being built on Bitcoin as well on what are called layer two solutions, I think. So... Um, what would you say to, if Pomp was here right now and he said, hey, look, I know Ethereum is doing some cool stuff, but I think Bitcoin is the most secure. It's the one that has got the proven track record and we just need to build on top of it with Lightning Network and Stacks and all the different things that are going on in that world. Like, what would you say to someone who thinks that? I think I'd say two things. The first is that it's a multi-chain world. Like Bitcoin was first, but there's no real reason why it should just be a single chain, single token, you know, Pepsi, Coca-Cola, pick, pick your arena. Right. So it's yeah. a multi-chain world. Uh, That's a fair point. Thing I, another thing I'd say is that 
Ethereum has a virtuous cycle that's already in place. And the virtuous cycle is that we have these great apps that have their liquidity, which is the money that's trusted to be stored inside of them. And then users use the apps and they pay fees and that drives new developers to come, which continues to improve the apps, creating this virtuous cycle. So anyone who wants to build DeFi or competing apps has to answer the question, how are they gonna compete with Ethereum's network effects, with Ethereum's virtuous cycle? And uh, there are, you know, there are projects that have interesting answers to that questions, uh, to that question. Uh, I don't think Bitcoin's really one of them. You know, there's a reason, you know, Vitalik Buterin is like uh, an extremely smart person. Uh, and he's also a very fair person who tells the truth and has always tried to do right by uh, the community. And he has, you know, a strong, strong value that we're trying to change the world and improve people's lives and bank the unbanked. And like, there's a reason that he didn't build DeFi on Bitcoin seven years ago. It's because Bitcoin does not have the ability to support a fully secure DeFi environment the way that Ethereum and its modern competitors do have that support. And so those who claim to be building DeFi on Bitcoin are, are you know, they're, they're working hard and they're, they're building apps and their apps are going to have value and they're building their communities. And, you know, I respect that. And I think the Ethereum community generally respects that. However, they do not have the technical ability to actually secure their DeFi on top of Bitcoin, the way that, for example, Ethereum's layer two solutions like Arbitrum, Optimism, Starkware, and ZK Sync are actually fully secured by Ethereum. Got it. That's, the technology that's, that's doesn't exist. Yeah. Yeah, no, and that's that's a great answer. And um, yeah, I wish I had someone on the other side to be able to share that. Maybe we'll do that. <laughs> Maybe we'll do a debate one day with, with someone else. Happy on there, to but... do so, Bilal. No, that's awesome. No, that's that's a great point. And, and the biggest thing for me personally is just a head start, right? Like, you know, Bitcoin had a head start in one use case. It's really nailed the narrative of digital gold. It works great. I, I love that about it. It's also less complicated in a way, which is a good thing. Um, and they can just keep focusing on that. Whereas, you know, it's not just a promise anymore on Ethereum. Like people have already been building this for years on top of Ethereum. And we're, we're seeing billions of dollars being, you know, uh, going through this through the pipes essentially trillions yeah one trillions. 1.5 trillion dollars in q1 of this year oh my god so yeah. just a quarter of the year 1.5 trillion in total Insane. settlements on ethereum that's crazy okay thanks for clarifying that yeah so we're already seeing that and yeah so yeah it doesn't mean there aren't going to be people who come along and create an alternative that has got um pros and cons to it of course technology we've seen over the years that happen but i think this isn't necessarily as easy as a switch the way people describe like Lycos to Google, right? Like, or Yahoo to Google, where they're like, well, Yahoo dominated, but then Google came around. I think there is an element of that argument to think about, but the difference there is literally someone just has to open a new tab and just type in Google versus going to Yahoo. Whereas I think to to rebuild what is being built on on the network essentially of Ethereum, that is not as simple as just copying and pasting. So so that's kind of how I think about it. And that's why I've made a personal big bet in this space. Um, uh, but at the same time, to, to extend what we talked about before, so we talked about Bitcoin. What about the alternatives? So I don't know enough about these platforms at all, but the one I've heard come up quite a lot is Solana. I think it's a, a based out of Switzerland or, or something like that, or the people built it came from that part of the world, I think. Do you know much about Solana and what what's your take on that as a as an alternative to Ethereum? I know um, a f so Solana is run by a highly credible organization that has made smart, in my view, strategic trade offs and. Uh, I've never said this publicly, but I, I consider them to be the second best programmable blockchain in the world, uh, better than Polkadot and, and, and the others. So I, I think that Solana is a very serious competitor of Ethereum. Uh, their main trade-off is that they uh, are not full throttle on decentralization. They have a less decentralized 
uh, organization as well as technology. And they've taken that relative lack of decentralization and their position is it's enough decentralization for a large portion of economic activity. And as a result of giving up that extreme level of decentralization that Ethereum embodies, they're less credibly neutral, which is to say they're less, you know, if you were a country, you'd have a lot more concerns about putting your sovereign bonds on Solana, in my opinion, than you would on Ethereum. But by giving up that extreme level of decentralization, Solana has been able to achieve a much higher baseline level of scalability on their core blockchain technology, as well as in their business model, they have a much more uh, kind of a centralized business development growth strategy in that they you know, specifically make large business deals. They directly sell into enterprise, into, into institutions, and they raise like, I think, $465 million this week to do that. And I'm sure yeah. other things as well. And so I think Solana is really a bet on a different way to build and grow a blockchain. And that way is more of a pragmatic level of decentralization than an absolute level of decentralization. And in my view, both are valuable. Mm. I'm much more of an Ethereum person. I think that Ethereum's maximum decentralization drives this credible neutrality that's going to result in many governments and mega corporations trusting Ethereum with their very sensitive financial instruments. And frankly, I just I don't see the case for them to put their sovereign bonds on Solana when Ethereum really is is a much, much better and more secure platform for that use case. Got like it. Ethereum 2.0 is designed to survive World War Three. So uh, mm-hmm. it's just a yeah. different universe in terms of the level of decentralization. But because Solana hasn't gone full throttle on decentralization, they're able to do kind of these fantastic business deals. Like, for example, they have this close relationship with FTX, which is one of the best cryptocurrency exchanges in the world. And, uh, and sorry, uh, there's a there's a thunderstorm outside. So if you see my face, uh, oh, it's cool. I thought it was a photo a shoot or something like oh, that. Oh, no, sorry. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> there's literally lightning going on. I've been uh, trying not to, not to, uh, move too much for the last 20 minutes but <laughs> no, just oh, uh, anyone watching if you see my face that's that's what happened but go on go on, back to what you're saying and so solana has this long-standing strategic partnership with this ftx exchange that's run by this sort of steve jobs type financial character named sbf sam bankman free and uh ftx has then gone and dumped like hundreds of millions of dollars to name the Miami arena as FTX arena, the physical stadium in Miami, the sports stadium. And then just recently, they've now done something in in the more digital world where they've paid uh, $210 million to rename uh, a very famous esports video game organization uh, to have FTX in the name. And so by making these business deals, which are totally outside the capability of the Ethereum community, because we're more of a federated decentralized model, like there, there's, there's simply not an actor in the Ethereum community that's prepared to shell out $200 million to rename a stadium to like ETH Stadium. It's, it's not in our DNA, but it is in Solana's DNA. So they go and they do these big business development deals through FTX and through their partners. And as a result, it's just sort of a different model and so I, uh, yeah. I think they're doing a good job, but I'm very much an Ethereum person and I believe in credible neutrality. And I, I think that uh, the fact that countries can trust Ethereum to keep its commitments is going to drive an unparalleled level of uh, new kinds of global trade agreements. And that's going to have a really big impact over the next several decades. And I just think nobody can compete with Ethereum on their on credible neutrality. Yeah, no, that's that's really well put. And um I think Solana is an example. I don't know enough about them, but it sounds like I've heard many people who I trust say they're doing a great job. So um, yeah, it'd be, it'd be interesting to see how that evolves. And I guess the key part of the thesis there is how much decentralization is needed for something to be effective and useful well, and how much do people NFTs care about it. And if you're minting NFTs at cat photos, it may not be a lot, right? But you know, yeah, when you're Europe point. and you're putting a trillion dollars of sovereign bonds on the blockchain, you better believe you're going to be caring about credible neutrality. So mm, I think there's space for, for both blockchains. Yeah, great point. Um, just a, a couple others here. So again, I think you mentioned Dot. 
I don't know enough about Dot and is, is, does Cardano c count as a an alternative as well or not really? We don't think so. We think, you know, I, I know a lot of listeners may not be happy to hear this, but most of us in the Ethereum community don't seem to think very much of Cardano. We think that, you know, uh, kind of the, the, the reigning promise out of Cardano is smart contracts are coming. The issue is that Cardano does not have, a, in our view, a great track record of execution. Mm. Uh, and even when smart contracts arrive on Cardano, there's not necessarily, like to your point, you're not just flipping that light switch. There's a whole building side of it where you have to build this network of applications and this network of developers and talent. And we just don't think Cardano has any chance at all of living up to its hype or its valuation. So that's kind of our, our view. No, that's, that's helpful. Um, yeah. That, so uh, are there any others to mention beyond Solana? I mean, the other thing I'd say, uh, which I've been looking at a little bit recently is Polygon Matic. Polygon slash Matic is the token. It's not an alternative, but it's, uh, I think, what's called a side chain. And it's something that a lot of people have been using recently um, because you can use Matic to, it's a lot quicker and the fees are a lot less essentially in the short term. I don't know enough about it. And I'm curious, is there anything to mention on Matic or side chains in general, like the need for them in the first place? Yeah. Matic has been great for the Ethereum community and will continue to be great. And uh, they're, they're much beloved and they've just done a lot for the space. And uh, that, that's a great thing. Uh, as well as side chains are, are here to stay because the, the kind of core blockchain, the Ethereum blockchain, including its scaling solutions, uh, has scaling limitations. And there's a couple different ways to get around those scaling limitations in terms of scaling the technology up to billions of people. And one of those ways is side chains. And it can be a pretty good way. You know, that being said, Matic has recently rebranded to Polygon, you know, to your point, and Polygon's stated mission is to be sort of a, a, a web of scaling solutions, a web of L2s and, and side chains for Ethereum. So uh, we could expect new kinds of scaling solutions out of Polygon that may, may be more like true layer twos that are fully secured by Ethereum in the future. You know, that's just speculation. Got it. Yeah, no, that, that's a great summary on that. Uh, uh, just a follow up question on Polygon specifically. Is there going to be a need, do you think, for these side chains when there's ETH 2.0 uh, in, in the first place? Because isn't that supposed to speed things up and bring the fees down already? Um, I think I, know, I have an answer from what I've heard, but I'm curious on your take. Right. Uh, the ETH 2.0 upgrade by itself is not directly a scaling technology. Uh, it is going to help scale the whole thing by, by making it a little bit faster and much more cost efficient and much more secure. And it, it enables uh, a future scaling technology called sharding to have different shards of the blockchain. Uh, but 2.0 by itself is not directly a scaling technology. Uh, but what, what scaling technologies are being built on Ethereum today and there's quite a few are really coming to maturity this year, you know, especially rollups like like Arbitrum uh, and and Starkware and Optimism and zk Sync. Those are kind of the four that we're particularly excited about this year. And uh, rollups are fully secured by Ethereum, and at the end of the day, they're going to end up having fairly high fees, you know, as Ethereum grows and grows. So the question is, when five, six billion people are using Ethereum every day or the Ethereum ecosystem, what can they actually use that's going to be affordable for them to use? And in mm, our view, there's, there's sort of like two main techniques to scale to billions of people. The first, side chains like Matic, we think they're complementary and they're cheaper because they, they're more kind of specialized and don't have as much traffic. And as a result, they tend to have... Uh, uh, a separate security and typically weaker security. Uh, and then the other kind of scaling solution is what's called a uh, roll-up with off-chain data, which is like a regular roll-up, except that you're trusting somebody to kind of hold on to your data in case you need it. And that's, that's sort of a technical topic, but it, it, it's not, you know, 
as purely secure as a roll up where you're actually not really trusting anybody. Got it. Yeah, no, that's that's really helpful for me even. And I've been watching these videos on YouTube and trying to get my head around it. But that that um, summarized the difference between the side chains and the roll ups specifically. Um, so that's really helpful. Um, last part here, because I know we'll have to kick out soon. And man, this has been as in depth as I've heard uh, at, um, an Ethereum discussion. So thanks for going from the basics all the way to all these advanced topics. Let's just wrap it up with in on the investing side. Again, not investing advice, but just to, we can share both of our uh, approaches to this. Um, and again, whatever you're happy to share. I know you've been investing in this space for a while and um, something you're doing full time. So how do you think about the way you invest in in the upside of Ethereum financially or beyond Ethereum, actually, just the crypto space as a whole? And and obviously, whatever you're happy to share, as detailed as you want or as little as you want, whatever you're comfortable with. Sure. I'm not a trader. I have no particular insight into the short term. And I know a lot of people have made a lot of money with traditional trading activities. And, uh, you know, they have their, their arbitrage bots and their, their Wall Street quant strategies that they pivot into crypto. And that works for a lot of folks. It doesn't work for me. I'm, I'm more of a value investor, almost like a Warren Buffett type, you know, not, not in terms of his success, obviously. But, you know, like I, I love that mindset that let's find the diamonds in the rough and let's get in uh, early and big if we can. Uh, and then let's just wait and monitor the situation and make sure things are going well. And that's been very good to me. And having been in this space for a few years, I think of my you know, investment in Ethereum as being about halfway or maybe 40% of the way through, through the investment life cycle in terms of my time horizon. So uh, over the short term, crypto prices are you know, they're so volatile, they're, they're practically effectively random. And I never, like personally, I've been doing this full time for a long time and I have no idea if they're going to go up or down. I'm always surprised, just like everybody else. And I just kind of have to live with that almost as like a force of nature. And so what I recommend to people is pick the tokens that you think are good ones. And to be clear, I think that, you know, Ether is a great token. And I'd recommend, you know, if, if folks were asking me, you know, not financial advice, but like to friends and family, I would say like, you know, all right, if you're going to, if you're going to play with a thousand dollars in crypto, you know, put, put 800 in ether, you know, put 900 in ether. And then the other hundred, 200 go nuts, pick stuff you think's cool, that you think's fun, that you, you think is exciting, that you think is an Ethereum competitor or, or, uh, many apps on Ethereum, many DeFi apps have their own tokens. And, and you know some of the best ones of those may be great investments for some people. And so for me, the strategy that I like is to put most of my crypto money in Ether because I see it as just being a really conservative, excellent investment that's really doing quite well. And I don't worry about what the price is today. I just, I buy in slowly kind of much as much as you as you have tolerance for. Uh, you know, maybe, maybe, you know, if you're getting in on your first day, you might put 20% of your money your first day just to get your, you know, your ankles wet right away. And then maybe you buy, you know, every week for another 10 weeks. To dollar cost average. To dollar cost average. Yeah. And the result is that you end up with a position, uh, an amount of ether that you're sort of protected from some of the short-term volatility. And after that, I say, just hold it. And how long do you hold it for? Hold it for a, a amount of time, not an amount of success. Because when, when Ethereum you know, doubles again and it gets up to 5,000 or 10,000, because we're from the traditional world, we get this feeling of, wow, that's a huge increase. I should sell, I should sell. But in my view, the truth is that no, you shouldn't sell. Ethereum has the potential to go up to 50,000 a coin, 100,000 a coin, if the wheels stay on as it grows to global ubiquity. And so in my view, don't, don't sell your ether when it reaches a certain price. Instead, be patient, wait five years, wait seven years, just wait and see how the growth begins to change the world. And that's how you're really going to make, you know, potentially I, we think life-changing money. And, you know, oh, if, yeah. if, if ether doubles, it doubles to 5,000 to 10,000 and you think about selling it. Well, look, man, 
Some people sold Amazon in 2010 and they said, Amazon's 16 years old. They've already invented AWS. They already sell all the books. I'm going to sell my Amazon stock. But uh, Alexa, stop, pardon me. Uh, but Amazon's done a lot like in the last 11 years, you know? So you, you want to be careful not to miss out on that upside as the Ethereum continues to, you know, kind of take over the world, we, we hope and think. Yeah. And, and I think that's fair. And the only thing I would add to that, again, is definitely not investment advice. Also, I don't know if you know, I have another podcast literally called Not Investment Advice, by the way. So, <laughs> so yeah, doubly covered there. Uh, I also would say all of this stuff, you know, me and you are definitely way deeper into this, you even more than me, than the average person. Um, I would spend time learning about it. And, and that's to me is the most important part because if you start to understand what's going on, I'll actually share a few links in the show notes. I'll share your your PDF. Um, there's a, a great write up by Packy McCormick who uh, from Not Boring. I'm actually doing a podcast with him for Not Investment Advice next week as well. Um, and he did a whole great breakdown of, you know, an amateur's point of view on why he's bullish on it. And there's a few others there as well. And just do your own research and whatever you choose to put in should only be an amount that you can live without because all of this stuff is something you should be holding long term and not worrying about to pay your rent or you've remortgaged your house to buy ETH. That's definitely not something I'd want people to be doing. So, um, yeah, that, that's the other caveat I would share is just make sure it's something that's proportionate to you feeling okay. If this went down tomorrow by 60% like it did a few weeks ago, how am I going to feel? Am I going to be running for my wallet to sell it tomorrow? Um, or am I able to realize, okay, this is just part of how it works long term. If you zoom out enough, you can see these crazy drops have happened for a long, long time. So that is it. And also there's there's still a high likelihood of things could go wrong, right? And that's the, the other side. We're definitely, I, I'm definitely very bullish on it, but we don't know. Like there's plenty of things that can happen. Solana could could really be what they promised to be. Um, and there could be issues, all these different things. So obviously bear that in mind when you're investing. Uh, the last question I did have though is on the advanced side of things. We This will be the last question because we got to go soon. Um, there's this crazy world of DeFi and yield farming and all this crazy stuff. So I'm curious, is that stuff that you play around with yourself uh, where you're trying to get greater than six, seven, ten percent yield by using some of these platforms? And if so, is there anything you could point me in the direction to check out? I do play around with that, but I'm a relatively conservative yield farmer. There are, there are folks who get up to all kinds of crazy schemes and promotional programs and I just learned it's called degen yield farming. <laughs> it sure is. Yeah. <laughs> it's crazy. The degen yeah, anyway, community. Yeah, degen community. But yeah, so was there anything in particular that you have found interesting, even with the conservative point of view? I would say two things. One, uh, the launch of Arbitrum is a real huge deal. And they were saying that their expectation is that there's going to be a lot of yield farming opportunities on Arbitrum later this summer as it opens up to general use. And fees on Arbitrum are gonna be, uh, you know, potentially 98% cheaper than using Ethereum directly, but it's still fully secured by Ethereum. It's advanced, it's, it's brand new technology, it's hot off the presses, everyone's really excited. Uh, it's been very well tested. So look for the yield farming opportunities on Arbitrum going into the summer. And the second thing I'd say is check out DeFiPulse.com. It has a list of popular DeFi services. And, you know, then you can go to those websites and some of them have yield farming opportunities. Yeah, that's a great point. And again, we didn't have time to go into what yield farming is properly today because it's, that's a very advanced topic compared to some of the stuff we talked about. Um, but listen, man, you've been amazing to talk to. I've enjoyed it so much, man. So I really appreciate the time. Um, is there anywhere we should be sending people um, your Twitter or website or anything you'd like to share with people? Yeah, thanks. You can find me on Twitter at uh, my full name, just at Ryan Berkman's and uh, my DMs are open. So if you're getting into crypto, I I'd love to hear from you. Yeah. And I'll link to that. We'll link to that in the show notes as well. And um, listen, man, this has been awesome. I I'm really bullish on this whole space. I think we're still probably in a bullish market. So there could be a huge drop again for several years in price but what i've found really cool is 
even with the recent drop in price from 4,000 to 2,000 or whatever it was, um, throughout that period, there was still amazing and cool stuff going on in the space. And it's the most bullish I've been and I've been uh, involved with it for a few years myself as well. So I'm feeling really pretty good about it. And I think uh, anyone who's listening to this, you're listening to this because you want to look at business opportunities. You want to see what's going on on the cutting edge of tech. And this is definitely one of the top three to five things I would say anyone should be looking at if you're interested in that world. So thanks again for, for doing this, man. Thanks, Bill. I appreciate it. I appreciate Take it. Care. Cheers.